from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Our guest this evening, as you know, is Amar Tolls. He told me last night that he, he was afraid that being last at the end of the day that nobody would come. <clears throat> Turn around. The room is completely packed. Amar worked for 20 years as an investment banker until, like so many investment bankers before Amy, began to pine for the financial security of being a novelist. <laughs> Don't laugh. In 2011, his debut novel, Rules of Civility, was a breakout hit. And his wonderful new novel, A Gentleman in Moscow, is still on the Washington Post bestseller list, though it was published last September. If you've read it, you know why. A Gentleman in Moscow is about a Russian aristocrat, Count Alexander Rostov. At the start of the novel in 1922, the Bolsheviks declare him a former person and sentence him to house arrest in a grand hotel near the Kremlin where he spends the next 32 years without ever leaving. No spoilers. That plot may sound a bit constraining, but in Amar's hands, it is wonderfully expansive because this hotel is a fascinating place, full of fantastic creature, uh, characters, some coming and going, others permanent, and of course, the most wonderful one of all is the Count himself, this elegant, sophisticated, unfailingly kind and generous man. Like hundreds of thousands of other readers, I fell in love with the Count. He truly knows the rules of civility, as does his creator. Please join me in welcoming Amar Tolls. Thank you. I want to uh, thank the festival for having me here. Ron, thank you for the introduction. But most of all, I really want to thank all of you for coming out tonight to hear me speak. Uh, as most of you know, uh, my, my relatively new novel uh, has a rather odd premise that it opens in 1922 at a Bolshevik tribunal in the Kremlin where a 30-year-old aristocrat is being interviewed. And in the course of this brief interview, it becomes clear that the Count wrote a poem as a young man that was very popular with the revolutionary generation. So he has some friends in the upper ranks of the party, as it were. But on the other hand, it's also clear that he's an unrepentant aristocrat. And so as something of a compromise, the tribunal decides that the Count can go back to the hotel where he's been staying, and if he ever comes out of the hotel again, he will be shot. And with the snap of a gavel, he's marched out of the Kremlin, across Red Square, and through the doors of the historic Metropole Hotel, and that's where he spends the next 32 years. And that's where I ask you to spend 32 years with him. Now, where did this odd premise come from? Um, I began writing fiction as a kid, I wrote it in high school, in college, and in graduate school. But when I was 25 and I moved to New York, I joined a friend of mine who had started an investment firm. And 20 years later, we were still working side by side. Now, ultimately, in my capacity as a spokesperson for the firm, I would spend a week in any given year in a hotel in Chicago, a hotel in London, a hotel in Los Angeles. And one year, when I was arriving at my hotel in Geneva for the eighth year in a row, as I walked into the hotel, I recognized some of the people lingering in the lobby from the year before. It was as if they had never left. And I thought to myself, this is a nice hotel, but can you imagine if you actually had to live in it? In the elevator on the way upstairs, I thought, that's actually kind of an interesting idea for a book. A guy gets trapped in a hotel for a long period of time. So in my hotel room, I took out the hotel stationery and I began sketching the outline for this story. Now, right off the bat, I knew that if I was going to take my protagonist and trap him in a hotel for 30 years, he shouldn't be there by preference. He should be there by force. And that made me think of Russia for some reason. <laughs> I made this little, you know, this little imaginative leap there. But as soon as I thought of Russia, I knew that I wanted to put the story in the Metropole Hotel. Now, I had visited the Metropole when I went to Moscow in 1998. I hadn't stayed there, but I had visited it because it's quite famous architecturally. It has a giant dining room with a hand-painted glass ceiling that covers the entire room, so I had gone to admire uh, the, the architecture of the building. So I knew something about the hotel. And what it really comes down to are, are two key factors. And the first is quite simply uh, location. 
Okay, here we go, and I know from the back it's going to be hard to see this, so you're just going to have to bear with me. This is a map of central Moscow. Now, if you look in the middle of this map, there is a little green triangle, and that's the Kremlin, the great stone fortress that's a thousand years old, where the czars lived and ruled Russia until Peter the Great moved the capital of Russia from Moscow to St. Petersburg. Now, just to the right of that triangle is a little empty white space. That's Red Square, which is just a great paved square with an ancient cathedral on either end of it. Now, if you went out the top of Red Square and took a right, in about a half a block, you'd end up in what is shown in the inset of this map in the lower right-hand corner, which is a, 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 a grand plaza with fountains and plantings in the center, around which are five majestic 19th century buildings all of which are significant in the history of the city. In the lower left-hand corner, you have a building that was known as the Palace of the Nobility. It was the private club of the nobility in the years before the revolution. It's where they would gather every year to celebrate anniversaries, weddings, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Um, after the revolution, it became known as the Palace of the Unions. It's where Lenin's body was first held in state when he died so the citizens of Moscow could come pay their respects before they embalmed the body and put it permanently on Red Square. Um, it's also where the famous show trials in the 1930s were held. At the top of the plaza is the Bolshoi, which of course is where the ballet performed then, it's where it performs still today. In the upper right-hand corner is the most expensive department store in Moscow, before the revolution and after the revolution too. Next you have the Mali Theater, which is one of the two most important dramatic theaters in Russia. And finally, in the lower right-hand corner, you have the hotel uh, itself, the Metropole. Um, so as I say, I knew the hotel to be in a very important location in terms of the history of, and the geography of Moscow. Um, but of course, of primary interest to me was the hotel itself. Now, everything you see in this picture is the hotel. The hotel is about the size of a city block with hundreds of rooms. Uh, this is from about 19, this is shortly after it opened in 1905, this picture. When it opened in 1905, the Metropole was without question the best hotel in Moscow. It was the best hotel in Russia. Uh, built with the finest materials, imported marble, imported crystal, uh, French furniture in the bedrooms. Um, it uh, was the first hotel in Russia to have hot water in the bedrooms. It was the first hotel in Russia to have telephones in the bedrooms. So it was without question the height of elegance when it opened. Now, while it was relatively unique in Russia, it was far from unique in the West in that regard. Because I want you to keep in mind that 1890 to 1910, roughly, this is the golden age of the Grand Hotel. This is when uh, large-scale, fine hotels were being opened in every major city in Europe and the United States, all along the Mediterranean coast and along the Florida coast. This is when the Waldorf Astoria opens in New York. This is when the Palace opens in San Francisco, uh, when the, the Breakers opens in Palm Beach, and all the equivalents in Europe at the same time. Now, uh, the grand hotels, they all tended to be uh, a size of a city block. They all tended to be made with the best materials. But in addition, they would have had a card room, a billiard room, uh, multiple ballrooms, a great palm court where tea would be served. Uh, shops on the ground floor that would go around the circumference of the building that you could enter from the lobby or from the street outside. Now, the Grand Hotels, of course, what they were designed to do to some degree was to satisfy the uh, demands of the great new wealth that came out of the 19th century, the Vanderbilts and their ilk. Um, but in addition, these hotels were designed to do something that hotels really hadn't been designed to do before, and that was to become an extension of their city. What I mean by this, the best way I can put this, is that if you went to the Metropole in the decade after it opened, on a Saturday night, more than half the people you saw pass through the lobby would have been Muscovites, not travelers. It would have been the local Russians on their way to the coffee house to meet friends, or to go to the fine restaurant, which was the best in the city, or to dance to one of the live orchestras that played there uh, every night. Um, so, as I say, it was a, uh, right from its opening, it was very much a part of uh, the social fabric of Moscow, visited on a weekly basis by the aristocracy, by the intelligentsia, and by the upper bourgeoisie. 
Now, having said that the Metropole shared many things with the Grand Hotels throughout Europe, a distinguishing characteristic is that 12 years after it opened, it found itself in the middle of a proletarian revolution. And it was very much in the middle of things. Um, as revolutionary activity was heating up in 1917, a lot of it was centered in St. Petersburg, where the Tsar was holed up in the Winter Palace, the Hermitage. But there was a lot of revolutionary activity uh, occurring in Moscow, and there were protests often on Theater Square, the, uh, where the Metropole was uh, located. Um, so uh, the soldiers who were on permanent guard in the Kremlin ended up taking over a portion of the Metropole um, just in case anything happened, they put snipers in the corner windows you see just left of center there, uh, looking out over Theater Square on, to keep an eye on any revolutionary type of activity. Now, in, in response to this, quite predictably, the Bolsheviks built barricades across the middle of Theater Square. And they stood behind the barricades with their weapons, with their backs to the Bolshoi, and you ended up in sort of a Mexican standoff. Now, in October 1917, uh, the revolutionary activity boils over in St. Petersburg, the revolutionaries storm the Winter Palace, they seize the Tsar and his family, and they are suddenly in control of the capital. News of this reaches uh, Moscow 24 hours later. And the Bolsheviks in Theater Square decide enough is enough, and they bombard the Metropole Hotel with everything they've got, breaking every single window in the hotel. Um, now, they successfully drive the soldiers out of the Metropole, out back across uh, Red Square, through the Kremlin, and they end up in control of the Kremlin. Um, now, we have a very interesting first-hand account of these events from an American. John Reed, the great American journalist whom Warren Beatty immortalized in the movie Reds, was a great classic Greenwich Village lefty. He loved revolutionary activity. And when he sensed there might be a revolution in Russia, he boarded a sh uh, an ocean liner, crossed the Atlantic, took a train to Mos uh, St. Petersburg, and he arrived just in time to follow the soldiers into the Winter Palace as they were seizing the Tsar. Now, when he came back out of the Winter Palace, he decided, I gotta go see what's going on in Moscow. So he boards an overnight train filled with soldiers, and he arrives in Moscow shortly after the battle for Theater Square. And the first thing he does when he gets there is he goes to the Metropole Hotel because it's the only hotel he knows by reputation. And he arrives and goes straight to the desk. He asks for if there's a room available for the night. And in this great, unflappable 19th century fashion, the desk captain replies, we do have a room, provided that the gentleman doesn't mind a little fresh air. <laughs> now, uh, at, with the revolutionaries in control of St. Petersburg and Moscow, this does not represent the end of hostilities in Russia. This represents the beginning of a five-year civil war. Eight foreign countries send soldiers into Russia with their own agendas. Uh, the whites, the soldiers who were loyal to the Tsar, are continuing to roam the countryside in small battalions trying to pick fights with the Red Guard whenever they find them in the hopes of turning back the tide of history. The revolutionaries are not a single force. They are multiple factions uh, who have been kind of working together, but also elbowing each other for control of the situation. Pretty early on, the Bolsheviks are the faction who control St. Petersburg and Moscow. Um, and actually, here we go. This uh, is, of course, uh, the head of the Bolsheviks, the father of the revolution, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, who was also the first leader of the new Russia once the Tsar had been uh, uh, d uh, killed. Um, I like to think of this as Lenin's uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in the Titanic pose, you know, <laughs> sort of leaning out over the bow there of his podium. Uh, this is Theater Square. Um, that's the Mali Theater behind him um, that I showed you a few minutes ago, because this is exactly where you would want to go if you wanted to gather a large group and you had an important speech to make. Um, this is 1920, so we're kind of in the middle of the Civil War here, and what Lenin is doing is he is speaking to factory workers and he is trying to convince them to join the Red Army and go to the Polish frontier. The great fear that the Bolsheviks had at this point was that a foreign power would take advantage of the chaos of the Civil War to launch a major in invasion. So they were constantly recruiting new soldiers uh, to protect the frontier uh, on the border. Um, now, this photograph is actually very famous for another reason. And that is that uh, 
Lenin, of course, the father of the revolution, the head of the new Russia, um, his number two, his right-hand man during the revolution and in the new government was Leon Trotsky, his old friend and comrade. And as usual, Trotsky is right here at Lenin's side as he gives this speech. Now, now you needn't bother looking for him. Um, here he is, he's the guy with the mustache and the captain's hat just to the right of the podium, kind of leaning on it as Lenin speaks. Now you, you can tell from these two photographs, which are taken seconds apart, um, that Trotsky's not in the first photograph. Now, he has not excused himself to go to the washroom. What's happened here is that while Trotsky was one of the first Bolsheviks to lead the new Russia, he was also the first one to fall out of favor. Um, he was pretty quickly kicked out of the Politburo, and then he was kicked out of the Communist Party. He was egg sent into exile, and he was eventually assassinated in Mexico City by Russian agents. And when that happened, the Bolsheviks went back and they airbrushed him out of all the photographs because <laughs> they didn't want Lenin to have to share his moments of history with his old comrade who had fallen from grace. Now, 1922, suffice to say that the Bolsheviks control the whole show. Um, they have uh, silenced the whites, they've sealed the border, and they've consolidated, the, to some degree brutally, the factions. And they are now in control of the entire country. And the first thing they do is they move the capital of Russia from St. Petersburg back to Moscow. Now this poses a significant problem for the Bolsheviks because Moscow did not have the infrastructure to support a modern government. You couldn't use the Kremlin for that purpose. It's an old stone building that hadn't housed government in hundreds of years. So what they did is they seized the three best hotels in Moscow, the National, the Savoy, and the Metropole. The Metropole is renamed the second house of the Soviets. They kick out all the guests. They sweep aside the luxuries. And the first thing they do is they put the leaders of the new government, many of them, in the suites, on the grand suites on the second floor. Because you want to keep in mind that the leaders of the Russian Revolution and the new government, for the most part, were not Muscovites. Many of them were not even Russian. So they literally needed places to stay. So they're given the suites in the hotel. But all the other rooms get emptied uh, to serve as all manner of governmental agencies that this room can imagine better than almost anybody else. So they're all filling in the building. The ballroom is emptied uh, so that they can have votes and speeches there. The fine dining room is emptied and is filled with cots so they can keep a standing uh, battalion of soldiers on site uh, just in case. Um, the first constitution of the new Russia is written in suite 217 of the hotel, the Metropole. Now at this point, the Metropole is basically the largest bureaucratic building in the new Russia. And that should have represented the end of its life as a grand hotel. Um, but an interesting thing happens over the course of 1922, and that is that the major European powers begin recognizing the Bolsheviks as the legitimate government in Russia. Now, it takes the United States more than a decade to come around to that point of view. But the European powers come to it quite quickly. Because keep in mind, they just spent, most of them, a couple of the last 150 years, they've been deposing kings, cutting off their heads, and establishing some kind of quasi-democratic governments in their place. So from the standpoint of Europe, it was time for the Tsar to go. And they viewed the Bolsheviks as the will of the people. So they recognized the government, and what that meant was that by the end of 1922, ambassadors start showing up in Moscow. Trade representatives from the major European governments show up in Moscow. Corporate executives from the biggest corporations in Europe and the United States show up in Moscow eager to establish ties and do business with the new regime. And what the Bolsheviks realize pretty quickly is that if they take these sophisticated visitors from the West and they put them in crummy proletarian hotels, the risk they run is that the visitors would go back to New York and Paris and London with the news that the revolution is failing. So. The Bolsheviks kicked all the party guys out of the Metropole. And they began restoring the hotel to its pre-war glamour. Uh, there were bellhops back in the lobby, uniformed uh, 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 doorman out in front, champagne and caviar in the dining room. And they reassembled the old orchestra, which began playing American jazz 
on a nightly basis. Now, initially, the restored glamour and liberty inside the metropole is reserved solely for foreigners. An ordinance is passed in the city of Moscow forbidding any Russian citizen from spending time in a foreign designated hotel or restaurant of which the metropole is example number one. So it's just the foreigners. But the citizens reclaim the metropole. Uh, the citizens of Moscow reclaim the metropole, and this occurs in two waves. The first wave is that the leaders of the Communist Party start hanging out in the hotel. They decide, you know what, it's not such a bad place. The food's pretty good, the liquor's pretty good, the music's good. So they're hanging out there, dining with their protégés, their comrades, their mistresses. Um, now, I think if you ask many Americans, what percentage of the Russian population were communists in the 1920s, the 30s, the 40s, right up into the Cold War, most Americans would say, I don't know, 90%, three quarters, certainly more than half. In reality, only 10% of the Russian population were members of the Communist Party throughout that period. Now, this is not because the other 90% didn't want to be members of the Communist Party. This is because the other 90% were not allowed to be members of the Communist Party. At the time of the revolution, uh, membership in the Communist Party was a badge of ideological honor. If you were a member of the party, it's because in the years before the war, you had organized trade, well, you, first of all, you could quote your Marx and Engels, that's for sure. Uh, you would organized trade unions. You'd printed pamphlets in basements. You'd probably done some time. And this is what has earned you your place in the party. But in the aftermath of the revolution, pretty quickly, what ended up happening is that membership in the party became a gateway to privilege. In those years, if you were a member of the Communist Party, you had access to special apartment buildings with larger apartments that you did not have to share with other families. If you're a member of the party, you had access to special grocery stores, where not only did they have bread and milk on a daily basis, they had delicacies. If you were a member of the party, your children were given better opportunities. You were generally treated better by the judicial system. So there's no question about it, through most of the Soviet era, membership in the Communist Party was a huge advantage to you and your family, and the membership were doled out very selectively to those individuals who had paid their dues and proven their loyalty to the powers that be. So suffice it to say that this group is hanging out in the metropole despite the prohibition because they can basically do whatever they want. Now the second wave is a much bigger wave. And what brings this about is a financial crisis. What I want you to remember is that at the time of the First World War, Russia was the most backward of all the great European nations. At that time, 95% of the population was illiterate. 85% uh, of the population were peasants, uh, still uh, plowing fields with wooden plows, oxen on somebody else's land, much in the manner that their great-grandparents had done as serfs. Um, there was very little industry in Russia. It was way behind the West. So one of the things the Bolsheviks wanted to do when they took charge is they wanted to vault over decades of failed investment and rapidly modernize Russia, to bring it into parity with the other Western powers from an industrial standpoint. This is what the five-year plans were all about, the rapid industrialization of Russia. Now, the problem the Bolsheviks had is that there was not, there was, they didn't have the expertise or the equipment in Russia to industrialize. The good news was that the major Western powers, including the United States, were perfectly happy to sell their equipment and expertise to the communists but they didn't want to receive the new Russian currency in exchange for these goods. They didn't want to receive an IOU. What the Western powers wanted in exchange was hard currency. And this means the Swiss franc, the British pound, uh, the US dollar, or gold. Initially, the Bolsheviks had a significant warehouse of hard currency, which they had seized from the aristocracy. But they had begun to run out before the five-year plans were over. And that was threatening the completion of the industrialization project. Um, now, the good news at this point was that there was still a lot of hard currency in Russia. 
It's just that it was under the mattresses of the civilians. The local population had realized pretty quickly early on that they didn't totally trust the new Russian currency, which was experiencing incredible inflation, and they could buy what they needed for their families on the black market very effectively with foreign currency. Um, so they were, they were uh, hoarding it. So the Bolsheviks came up with this ingenious compromise. They say, okay, once again, we are going to open the foreign designated restaurants and hotels in Moscow to the citizens of the city, provided that when you dine at the Metropole, you pay your bill in foreign currency. And through this compromise, the Bolsheviks rake in the hard currency they need to complete the modernization of Russia, and the citizens of Moscow reclaim the liberty and glamour with inside the walls of the Metropole Hotel. Now, just in case you think I'm making this up, <laughs> because I am not above that, by the way, <laughs> what I want to do is I want to read to you a very brief passage uh, from the memoirs of Eugene Lyons. Now, Eugene Lyons was the United Press International Moscow correspondent in the late 20s and early 30s. Um, and he spent a great deal of time in the Metropole because from the time of the Revolution until the Cold War, the bar at the Metropole was the watering hole for all American and British journalists. It's where they met every night. So in all their memoirs, throughout that period, they talk about the Metropole in some detail. And what I'm going to read to you is this brief passage where Lyons is describing what's going on inside the hotel in the early 30s. This one moment. Um, and I want you to keep in mind, that means this is a few years after the great Ukrainian famine, when millions died, a time of terrible sh shortages in Russia. And it's a few years before the great purges ramp up. So in, a, in, a, in essence, in a very dark decade for the Soviet citizenry, this is what's going on inside the hotel. The Metropole was the new social center of the bourgeois colony. Its main restaurant was a Russian peasant's dream of capitalist splendors. Immense candelabra, oversized lights, heavy furniture, a jazz band of symphony orchestra proportions. The chief pride of the restaurant, its ultra bourgeois touch, was a great circular pool where lights and rather proletarian looking fishes played. On grand occasions, the chef in cap and apron emerged from his sanctum with a net over his shoulder and captured a fish for special customers bearing foreign currency. The dancing couples rotated around the pool, and sometimes an unstudy customer joined the fishes to the great delight of the assembled crowd. Um, actually, oh, here we go. will this pop up again? Can you put that? Oh yeah, there's the dining room. Um, this, this is a picture of, uh, it's, you're seeing about 60% uh, of the room because of what, the position of where I was standing. Um, that's the great hand-painted glass ceiling that I mentioned earlier that you can see at the top. These are the giant lights that Lyons is describing. That's the fountain where the, the chef would come to get the fish. That's the bandstand in the back of the room. Um, the only thing different in a period photograph is that there would have been about three or four times as many tables with everybody in there elbow to elbow having a grand old time. Now, what I love about that Eugene Lyons passage is that it could easily have come from a memoir of someone in F. Scott Fitzgerald's circle describing what was going on at the Plaza Hotel in the 1920s. It is crazy that this is what was going on inside the Metropole across the street from the Kremlin and around the corner from the headquarters of the secret police at the height of the Soviet era. Um, and this, of course, is what interests me in the hotel, this paradox. Now, for those of you who have not read the book, um, most of what I've just said isn't in the book. Okay, it's not in the book. This is the kind of stuff that's helpful to me as kind of a background to think about. Uh, because the book is not a Wikipedia entry. It's not a work of history. It's a novel. And so appropriately, at the center of it are individuals. And most significantly is the figure of the Count himself, who at the age of 30 is sentenced to life in the hotel. Uh, and he's lost all his possessions. He's lost his family. He's lost his social standing. In a way, more profoundly, he's watching as everything that he values in Russian life is systematically being uprooted by the new regime. This is how he begins his internment. And over the course of his 30 years in the hotel, he must find, he must establish new relationships. He must find new causes for happiness, however small, 
and he ultimately must find a new sense of purpose. And this is really what the book is about. Having said all that, I would be happy to answer your questions, and if you don't have questions, I will ask them myself. <laughs> oh, yes. Characteristics I really enjoyed um, that the Count possessed were his adaptability and his humor. Can you talk about how those two served him well? Yeah, how does his adaptability and his, the, the, can you all hear the question? I don't know, but, uh, but um, I think, so let's talk about those in separate, we'll take them to, to two parts. Adaptability, there's no question about it that early on in the crafting of this novel, first of all, I should say, I outline everything way in advance. Uh, I, but when I sit down to write chapter one of a book, I know every chapter, every event, every character, every setting, their backgrounds, all major events, some of the ideas, some of the poetry, so the outline for me is about 50 pages long when I start. Um, but now, yes, I knew very early on that the Count in his internment had two things really going for him. And the first was that uh, this notion that his grandmother gives him as a young boy, which is described early in the book, which is that you know, he loses a checkers game and he throws a tantrum in essence, and his grandmother says, you know, listen, losing isn't fun. There's nothing good about losing, but why would you have given your opponent the satisfaction of seeing you act that way, in essence. And he sort of has that throughout his life. You know, why would you ever give your opponent the satisfaction of showing that you've been you know, uh, unsettled by what they've done? Um, but secondly, he's a born optimist. He's one of these people who just imagines from birth that most things are probably gonna work out for the best and most people are probably good at heart. And these are the sort of the things that he has carrying with him in his, that make a big difference in his, in his life in the hotel. Um, and yes, I think that humor became a very important component of that that I did not anticipate. So if I went back and said, if I looked at the 50 pages of outline, first of all, there's not a lot of humor in an outline. You know, that's the nature of an outline. It's not funny. So, you know, if I went back and looked at the outline, it's, the outline doesn't suggest that there was going to be humor in the book. And that was something that, that it kept growing over the course of the crafting. And, and you get at a point where you're like, you're writing a scene that's particularly comic, and you kind of have to ask yourself, am, is this, am I off the rails? You know, is this humor, am I taking this into farce? Am I, is this no longer the book I thought I was writing? And, and, you know, you have to sort of go through that. And there was a certain point where I was like, you know what, I'm going to go with this. This aspect of the humor, I think, is true to the count, and it's true to the life of the book. Uh, but yes, go ahead, please. Hi. A lot of feedback. Um, I, both of your books are very different um, and written in a similar format that totally envelops me. Sorry. Yep. Written in a format that envelops me and takes me to someplace else, and I really appreciate that. And also with protagonists who are actually likable, which I think is something that's missing in literature nowadays. Um, well, some literature. What are you working on next? Because they're so different. I'm excited to hear if you have something very different coming up down the line, or similar, because I really love those other books. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> I am not writing a sequel to A Gentleman in Moscow. The, the future of these characters are in your hands. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, what am I working on next? I, I am, um, as I said, I design books long in advance, so I am well towards completion of the design phase of my next book. I will start writing it in January, when I'm, I'm, I'm done being on the road. Uh, and. That book is about three 18-year-old boys who are on their way from Kansas to New York City in 1952. And that's about all I'll tell you about that. Awesome, can't wait. But it is different. <laughs> and it's true, you know, you, you've made, it's a good point. I, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a part of my mode. I, I, I want to investigate something new, try something new. I'm very interested in how each book I, I write, I think should sound different. If you're dealing with different people, different themes, the book itself should sound different. And, uh, and that's part of the, the, the joy for me creatively is to try to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Left. Yeah, Mr. Tolls, thanks. That was a great summary background for the book. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And also the lesson we never learned that the profiteers always supply the, so, uh, the rope that will hang them. But yeah. more on that later, no doubt. Uh, I'm rather intrigued by your approach to the book, and I wonder if you could um, say a little bit more about how you went about selecting the actual characters, because as I understand, um, they're very different voices, and I wondered how you modeled them, uh, you know, where they came from, yep. uh, if you could go a little... You're about the individual characters in A Gentleman yes. in Moscow? Yeah, and the, why, and I appreciate why you picked them. Yeah, I appreciate your saying that they, they see, seem different. That's certainly the goal. Um, you know, and, and I think... Um, 
Well, I'm going to give a, I'm gonna give a little longish answer to this because I, I think it, it matters. You know, uh, well, first, I'm going to put it like this way. Uh, if you look at the major fine arts, um, music, classical music, uh, you know, uh, fine painting, you know, oil painting of the 19th and 18th, 17th centuries, what have you, uh, the novel. Um, if you look at painting, uh, a fine painter of the 19th or 18th century can depict a place and a moment in time so well that we can see it from across the room. You know, you, you, uh, yeah, you see that Hudson School painting and you're like, I can just, I know what that, pl even if I don't know exactly where that place is, I know the feeling of it, I know what it means, and I, I can imagine it. And um, with, with fine music, a capable cellist can transmit a sense of emotion in about two seconds. You know, the drawing of uh, the strings across the bow four times, you know, can, can signal to us a great sense of sorrow or joy, like instantaneously in this incredible way. Now, the novel can give us a sense of time or place. It can give us a sense, it can uh, trigger emotions for us in a more cumbersome fashion than those art forms. Hmm. But what the novel can do that the other art forms cannot do is that it can put us in the position of another individual in a real sense. A well-crafted novel, as readers, we can begin to live the life of that individual who's at the center of the story in particular, such that when that individual is, has a setback, we, we can actually, we can shed a tear, literally. When something funny happens to that person, we, can, we laugh out loud about it. Uh, when when uh, uh, you know, their, their victories and their setbacks are, are felt by us as, as loss or joy, we get to the point where we can imagine what they would say in a different circumstance. They travel with us like family. So I, I think that, that not even, the other art forms cannot do this, not even film. Mm. So I think anybody who aspires to write serious narrative as a young person, this becomes one of the big elements of craft that you try to command. A novel involves many aspects of craft. Dialogue, setting, tone, philosophy, metaphor, the poetry and the sound of the words themselves you know, the structure of the book. Each of these is its own art form in a way. But the creation of three-dimensional individuals is the most important of those. Mm -hmm. If you think about the books that have affected you in your life, almost certainly there are individuals at the center of them that you think of as people. And so, so you, that's what you work on as a young person. Constantly, or I did, constantly adopting a, a different personality to write a different story. What would they say? What would they think about? What would they look at when they entered the room? and try to imagine that all different people, different ages, races, whatever. Um, and, and so until it becomes to some degree second nature and you start to imagine the story and it populates itself and you're like, that's the guy, that's her, that's him. You know, that's the way it works. But basically it's from, it's from nothing. Hmm. Not, not watching too many Russian films. No, yeah. <laughs> it's alchemy, it really is alchemy. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I really love the writing and the characters and I, found myself thinking as I was reading this book, oh, this is so charming. Oh, isn't this lovely? But what's the big deal? I mean, it's just like this story that's going on and on and on. And then... <laughs> you should have written the blurb on the back of the no, book. No, no, no. On and on and on. <laughs> but then at about 75 pages before the end... Yeah. No, was, no spoilers. No, I'm not going to spoil it. it but it was, I was on the edge of my seat. Yeah, okay. And, and so, but what you were just saying before about how you outlined the book. Yes. You know, I've listened to other authors here yeah. say, you know, I started this book and I had no idea where it was going. Right. And so you must have at the beginning said, aha, they're just going to think they're going along this lovely yes. little stream and then yeah. boom, it's going to turn into yeah. Niagara Falls. That was the plan. It says, really bore them for a hundred <laughs> I wasn't, but I then, wasn't bored. But then, no, you no. know, <laughs> at page 350, I'm going to let them have it. You know? Um, no, no, in all seriousness, I, you know, I... I know, I, I'm, I wasn't <laughs> bored. I just didn't yeah. see why people were going, oh, my God. And okay. then I got to that point, and it was like, oh, my God. <laughs> You're very frank. <laughs> That's good. No, you know, now this I, is going to be well, in the Library of Congress. Thank no, you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I... Uh, I, I, I would just change the shape of what you're saying a little bit for me, which, <laughs> which is that I knew, I knew that the first hundred pages in particular were going to be tough in the book because it's about a person being trapped in a building and not moving and, and who has to go through a, an element of claustrophobia and a feeling of depression 
because the book depends upon that. Now, in addition, this is a book in which a lot of elements in the first 100 to 200 pages show up later in all kinds of interesting ways. And so my challenge was to get you through this period of, of the hard part of the internment, but also to give you a lot of raw material that you don't notice but that you're not driven crazy by and that later it'll pay off for you, you know? So, I, you know, hopefully most people have that experience at page 100 instead of 350, but... You know. It did yeah. pay off, let right, me right. say that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, you're welcome. Oh, sorry, left, yes. Well, I don't know if I'm left. I'm my left. <laughs> um, first of all, um, I do have a question, but I have to say, my good fellow, that I don't think the Count would have unbuttoned his collar oh, yeah. while he had on a tie. Oh, you know, it's a long day. What can I say? Man, this is tough, tough audience. Good oh, Lord. Is this on C-SPAN? Jesus Christ. They will be. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry. I Sorry. loved, loved on and on. I just thought it was brilliant. Thank you. And every word... Thank you, Robert. Thanks. And every word you write, you talked about the craft. Uh, you, everything you said, I was going to say about you, how beautifully. I mean, I don't know how you can be so smart. <laughs> you are, it's yeah. beautifully written. It's a pleasure to read. Your choice of words are just like, oh my god, I love that. And they're surprises, and they're beautiful surprises. Just your, your ability to write is phenomenal. You don't have to ask a question. You can keep going. I mean, that's fine. I mean, it's great. You're doing, you're doing great. No. That works for me. Um, but my question is one that you will not answer, because I know you won't. Okay. But I do. I'm going to ask it in a way that might trick you. Okay. And I don't, I, I don't want to make it a spoiler deal. So. Yeah, but don't, nothing about the back half of the book, please. No, 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 but I mean, I'm going to couch it. Okay. But you must have a point of view, because I've been arguing already with my friends and our book club meets in a week on this. Did they stay there? Oh, you know what? Yeah, I think if you're going to start asking, no, okay, wait, wait, wait. No, wait, wait, wait. a minute, wait not, a minute. No, 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 no wait a minute. All I, I, I want you to grab me afterwards, and I'll answer your question very specifically. But I don't want to give any suggestions of, of anything that might matter in the end, and it's going to be hard for you to do that. Thank you. So I, please, find me right after. I will tell you. I'll, I'll tell you. All right, I but I don't want, want to spoil it for other people. Okay. I just want to know what your personal inner self hoped. Yeah. That's all. Uh, well, I'll tell you that, too. That's hard to answer without other people having finished the book. But, okay. Um, no. Uh, but the book is, full, is an exp Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I mean, you, yeah. Is that an after thing also? Yeah, it's an after thing. Right. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Well, anyway, please. thank you but very much. But thank you for much. the compliments. I really Beautiful appreciate it. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, so this won't be a spoiler question, okay. and I actually have a, a small question afterwards, but um, clearly with both of your novels, you have a central theme of a personal code of ethics. The first one is called Rules of Civility. Right. Um, so I wanted to hear more about how you stumbled on that theme. Yeah. Is that showing up in your... Yeah, for, for those who haven't read my, my my either of my books or my first book, I mean, Rules of Civility and Gentleman Moscow both to some degree deal with these with these uh, ideas around uh, civil behavior. And, um, and I, so the first thing I want to say is my next book has nothing to do with civil behavior. <laughs> there is no civility in it whatsoever, you know? Uh, but, I, you know, I, th I think, you know, uh, the, best, the, most thing, the most interesting thing I can say about it in regard to a gentleman in Moscow is that um, I think that we, in our modern times in America, think of civility and, and uh, elements of etiquette as kind of a nice frosting on the surface of behavior, kind of shallow in a way. We, in kindergarten, our kids learn to say please and thank you, and isn't that nice because it'll, it'll impress grandma or whatever. Um, but it's kind of at that level to some degree, and on a blown up basis. But, but for, the, for the figures like the Count in the 19th century who would have been raised in an aristocratic upbringing and an educated, refined upbringing, um, they would have viewed it very differently. And in fact, it would go all the way back to the Stoics and then repeated in the Age of Enlightenment figures, very much on the mind of the Founding Fathers as a class. Um, and, and for them, the notion of civil behavior, it was in essence an outward expression of an inward struggle. And the inward struggle was over the mastery over the seven sins. You know, the notion is, going right back to the Stoics, was that yes, we are all born with these impulses to greed, gluttony, lust, 
sloth, what have you. We all have those impulses. But the Stoics and the Age of Enlightenment thinkers believe that these, we could master these impulses. Um, and that to do so required reflection, it required having role models, and it required having a code of behavior that you, at- you tried to adopt and to live by. Um, now, if you think about polite politesse, simple polite behavior, in many cases, the whole role of it is a delay. It's a little simple delay. Um, so picture a dinner party. And the notion here is that polite behavior teaches you that before you take that second helping, you know, before you uh, make a crude joke, before you make a pass at a member of the un- opposite sex, you know, before you show impatience to the person serving at the table, what have you, politeness was taught, told you that's inappropriate behavior and it was to, you'd stop for a second. But the notion is that in that moment when you stop, you then look inward and you say, you know what, that's, I'm, I, that's not the right behavior anyway. And then you, you turn to your inward angels and you try to do the opposite. You offer someone a second helping. You say the polite thing. You, you, know, you change the subject before it gets uh, off color, what have you. This is really what politeness was about. It was about allowing you the moment to complete the battle, as it was over these elements. And so, so the Count is very much from that tradition. And, and so for him, uh, civil behavior is very much, it's tied to moral behavior. And part of the interesting aspect of the book is he finds himself in uncivil times. And, and, and I think that I, you know, I came to sort of feel, and this may be, uh, well, is that in uncivil times, a civil act is itself an act of rebellion. And you know, that's kind of what the, the life the Count is living. Now I have, a, I, somebody, but that's that. But now somebody would signal me. Are you saying that I'm done? Where are we, what, what's the, what's the, what do we have on the clock? We gotta go, okay, well, okay, wait, wait, wait. Then I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be able to answer your six questions, but I am gonna tell you one more story because he promised me I was gonna be able to um, before I go. And that is, you know, I, I, as I, the book is an invention. The people are an invention, the circumstances are inventions, um, but inevitably, while you're writing a novel, aspects of your personal life will percolate up through the, in, the inventive process. And there's no question about it that in A Gentleman in Moscow, the single most important aspect of that, version of that, was in the creation of Nina and Sophia, the two young girls in the story. Uh, the Count meets a nine-year-old girl at the age of, when he's 30, at the beginning of his internment, and she has a big impact on him. Much later in his life, he's asked to keep an eye on a five-year-old girl, and she has a big influence on him. And there's, the, the source of the, these two girls is, really comes down very simply to the fact that when I came up with the idea for this book, my daughter was five, and when I finished writing it, she was nine. <laughs> and, my daughter at that time is really the one who gave me the insight into how shrewd a little girl can be. <laughs> They're very clever. They are not to be underestimated in any way. And you know, I, you know, just to sort of give you a sense for that, uh, uh, give you a sense for that. Um, on New Year's Day this year, we got to dinner. Me, my wife, my daughter, my son, and I say, my daughter's now 11. I say, hey, um, why don't we go around the table? And we'll, you know, share New Year's resolutions. You know, that'd be fun, New Year's Day, what do you say? And without missing a beat, my daughter says, Dad, don't you think, uh, oh, there she is. Yeah, that's, well, that's sort of premature, but all right, well, there she is. You can imagine. She says, at 11, she says, Dad, uh, you know, New Year's resolutions. Don't you think uh, you should be focused less on New Year's resolutions and more on your bucket list? <laughs> yeah. That's terrible. Terrible. So I hit her with my cane, which, which is the only appropriate response, you know, under those circumstances. Okay, but so, so what I'm going to tell you is, when my son was eight and my daughter was five, uh, their favorite restaurant in New York was this little Italian place right down the street from us called Paul and Jimmy's, a third generation joint, you know, chicken parm, veal, you know, marsala, you know, real classic stuff, spaghetti and meatballs. They liked the food, but what they really loved was how they were treated by the staff. You know, when we would go, uh, my kids would, our kids would run ahead of me and my wife, and they'd burst through the door of the restaurant. And the staff would say, oh, senor Tolls, oh, la principessa, you know, come in, come in. And when we got to the restaurant, they'd be seated at our table, you know, looking like they owned the place, right? They loved it. So when my son turned nine, we said, hey, Stokely, you know, for your birthday, where do you want to go for dinner? We'll go, we can go anywhere in the city within reason, assuming that he'd say Paul and Jimmy's. And instead, in this very wistful way, he says, oh, wouldn't it be great 
if we could go to Smith and Walensky's. Now I'm like, you know, for those of you who don't know, that's like a venerable old steakhouse in Upper New York, up to, up to Upper East Side. And I'm like, where does an eight-year-old boy get an idea of a steakhouse? You know, what, what are they teaching you in that school? And what well, turned out, the year my son turned nine was the year they put TVs in the back of taxi cabs in New York, and the very first ad was Smith and Walensky's. So he'd seen it a hundred times. So I said, Stokely, if you want to go to Smith and Walensky's, we can do that. And he says, you mean it's in New York? I'm like, yes, it's in New York. So on his birthday, we all dress up, we go uptown. Now, if any of you have been to this joint, what, what you know is that the, the waiters at Smith and Walensky's, they, they look like, they're all these big old guys, they look like butchers. And in fact, they wear white butcher's aprons. That's what they wear. And so we get seated in our banquette, and our waiter comes over, and he says, a six-foot tall guy in a butcher's apron, he says, all right, welcome to Smith and Walensky's, let's get down to business. Uh, you know, what are you going to have tonight to drink, ma'am? A martini, good choice. For you, sir, another martini, well done. Young man, a Coca-Cola, it's on its way. And what about for the little baby? <laughs> now, the second he says this, he realizes he's made a terrible mistake from the expression on my daughter's face. So after a moment of silence, my daughter says to this six-foot-tall guy in a butcher's apron, she says, I am not a baby. At the other restaurant, they call me La Principesa. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for coming out to the book festival. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.